Okay, so thank you for being here. Welcome. Um, I'm going to try to keep this pretty informal. So I'm okay with people coming off mute and asking me questions or or sharing their own thoughts like throughout the presentation. If it if it starts to be too much, I might say let's hold it till the end. But for now, feel free to come off come off mute, ask me questions, ask clarification questions, um, and it can be more of a dialogue. Uh, before I get into the nerdy work stuff, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Sarah. Um, I have five things that I think if you know these five things about me, you know me pretty well. <laughs> um, my sister, her name is Allie. She is my favorite person in the world. Um, she has, you know, maybe is a little more, uh, a better haircut than this these days, but it's just as adorable. Um, I am, I kind of like consider myself a nomad at heart. I've always been someone who is just excited by change. Um, and I also physically just like to be on the move. Um, I've lived in many different cities. I lived outside of the US for a year, living in a different country every month and actually doing remote freelance product work for a while. Um, Cause I kind of just got to go owning a lot of belongings. Um, I, feel lucky that I have found my way into product management. Um, I think a lot of people can probably relate to this, but when I was in school and even at my uh, first job, like I still didn't really know what product was. And um, I, after, you know, talking to people and a few lucky chances have found that it's a really good match for my personality. Um, and uh, you'll notice also lately, I focus especially in early stage product development. So um, startups, uh, but I started my career at bigger companies. So one of the things that I think I can hopefully help provide some perspective on is how product works, how, how it hopefully can be the same, regardless of the type of company or product you're working on, but also the differences. Cause I've, you know, been the first PM, um, at a company of four people. And I've also been, you know, one of a hundred at a company of, uh, a hundred thousand employees. So, um, <clears throat> 2020, I think everyone could agree that was a pretty shitty year um, for most of us. I think not like it's a competition that I'm trying to win, but um, on top of that, just personally, um, I also was diagnosed with um, leukemia. Um, I like to mention it kind of just out the gate because everyone's always a little surprised if you're meeting me for the first time and um, I'm bald and slowly starting to grow some hair back, but the good news is um, the treatment is going well. I'm halfway through a two-year program, um, and it's just something that's become pretty core to my identity and potentially in future topics, um, something we can cover too, because I think a lot of people actually um, are dealing with a lot more personally that influences their work lives than we all seem to realize, um, and it, it, it's a skill set. You need to learn <laughs> how to work with those things too. Um, and yeah, challenge. Um, you'll notice that nothing motivates me more than you telling me I can't do something. Um, and that seems to be the same um, for this talk uh, because <laughs> it turned out to be a lot harder to try to fit in to an hour than I was expecting. Um, so that's me. Thank you again for being here. Um, I created this meetup group. I'm calling it the new product manager group um, because um, over the last 10 years, I feel like, you know, product has become such a hot topic. Everyone, you know, if you're the CEO of the product, um, everyone uh, wants to kind of get into tech and it's a good way in because you don't have to be an engineer. And it's just a lot of people are starting to write and talk about it now. Um, but I think ever, a lot of people are still struggling um, with how to do the job well. Um, and honestly, what leaves me frustrated and the reason I just was like let me try to <laughs> create a group where we can talk about these things is that I feel like I read so many articles and go to so many talks where it's the same general things over and over again but no tangible specific advice on how to be a better product manager so like I cannot read another article um you know telling me why north star metrics are important um or why you know you have to do user research but then you know not giving me tangible tips of like if I'm working 70 hours a week, how can I do more user interviews during the day? Like, how can I do these things that you're telling me I should do? Um, and so this group is really for people who are really passionate about how can I become a better product manager? 
Um, it's not about how can I get a title? How can I get more influence in my company? How can I, you know, be more successful? It's just like, you're motivated by product. You love the challenge. You like, love the type of problem, problems that lets you solve. You want to get better at it. Um, I don't think it matters what stage of career you're in. I don't think it matters how long you've been a PM, what kind of company you're at, whether you're working on a B2C, B2B, internal analytics tool, or anything, what kind of product it is. It's just if you're interested in, you know, getting better as a product manager and um, walking away with real tips on how to get better tomorrow rather than general platitudes, hopefully this will be a group that you enjoy. Uh, and some of the things that I think future to topics we'll cover are things around product discovery and validation. So how we can make sure as PMs that we are building things that um, are actually worth time building. Um, learning um, tips about how to better understand the people who actually use your products. Uh, a lot about data, obviously, we're talking about that today and how to measure the value and impact of the work that you're doing. A lot of team stuff, leadership stuff, people always call these the soft skills, um, but the reality is as a product manager, you know, you can be the smartest person or like the most innovative person, but if you can't, you know, figure out how to lead a team and get people to want to work with you, you're going to have a really hard time. Um, and that kind of ties back to just the perseverance mindset overall, because I think, um, you know, no matter what, the one thing that you are going to need as a PM is the ability to um, just continue to try things, continue to not be deterred if things don't work out um, it, how you thought they would and just trust the process, continue to focus on the fundamentals um, and, and persevere and be patient. Um, and so, yeah. We're, today we're going to talk about um, specifically data analytics and how to embed it um, more every like every day. So every decision you're making is hopefully founded in something about the people who use your product and what you know about them. Um, and I just wanted to share three things that I kept in mind while share. I'm going to share a few examples today. I'm going to share some screenshots, things like that. Um, that but everything is kind of like has an asterisk by it, which is like, please do not get tied up in like the specific tools or the examples that I'm using or the specific screenshots. Like don't pay attention to the methods, just think about the mindset. So um, you have, the examples are more a demonstration of how you can think about um, using analytics. It's not about, you know, how to actually set it up yourself because we don't have time to get into that. It's too much detail. Um, and so once again, the examples, they're meant to be inspiration. I don't expect any of you to say like, you know, leave here and exactly implement what I, how I do things. Um, and even as I was putting it together, I was like critiquing myself because I was like, this could be so much better. Like, this is a stupid example. So um, just use the examples as inspiration. Do not use them as gospel or things that you should exactly replicate. Um, and then last but not least, um, <laughs> I just have a personal mantra, which is um, anytime I'm kind of like over stressing about something, um, trying to get it too perfect, you know, or yeah, just overthinking, I have this word mangoes, it's my kind of like safe word where it just reminds myself to not take myself too seriously. Um, so this group is all about just really trying to get better at our job, um, have real talk, don't talk in generalities and be super informal. So ask questions, challenge me. I'm okay to have discussion. This doesn't need to be formal. All right. I'm gonna get into the actual content now. Um, I just wanna make sure, can everyone, is my sound volume okay? Is, are the slides okay? Any? Anything I should adjust before we get into the, thank you, Claire. Great, thank you everyone, I appreciate it. Okay, um, so what my kind of whole hypothesis or what my assertion that I'll say for this talk is, um, I want to help everyone figure out how as a product manager you can learn more and you can learn faster. Um, and 
So one of the things that I asked when people join this group was what you, you know, why you want to learn this, why you want to join this group, what you want to learn. And specifically when you think about um, measuring the impact and using data to make better decisions, um, these were kind of the three main areas that you all said you were interested in learning more about, which is, um, you know, when I'm making updates to my product, <clears throat> what do I actually want to learn with this update? So it's like, what are the metrics I should be looking at? What are the things that I should be caring about? What, what should I want to learn? Um, and then the second thing is, okay, well, how can I actually learn that um, today faster? Um, because a lot of people talked about challenges um, around, you know, how hard it can be. You, you might know that you should be wanting to learn something, but it might take too long to learn that. So do I have time to wait on that? So everyone here was interested in learning, like thinking more about what do I want to learn when I'm making updates to, I, to my product? How can I set up processes to actually learn that information quickly? Um, and then once I have that information, what, what do I do with it? Like, cool, I have some number that tells me 25% of my users do X, Y, Z. Like, what do I do with that information? Is Why is that valuable? Um, and uh, this is really the only time I'm going to like do that thing and say, I, I'm going to take a step back um, because all of this is everyone has to have the same understanding of what it means to be a product manager and what our goal is as a PM. Um, and a lot of what I've learned as a product manager is just through reading other people's work. So um, I think, Matt, you're on here. You're probably the one who first introduced me to Marty Kagan. <laughs> um, if y'all haven't read stuff by him before, I'm sure most of you have. He's one of my favorite product leaders to learn from. Um, and this is how he frames, like, what is the job of a product manager? Your job is to deliver a product that people actually find value in and that works for your business. Um, your job as a product manager, we hopefully all know this, is not to ship things on time. It's not to execute on your roadmap. It's not to check off this whole list of requirements. Like none of that matters if it doesn't result in something that people use and that your business can make money off of. Because at the end of the day, the product is just a means to, you know, typically you're building a product for a company that wants to exist, that needs money and has a business model. And so as a product manager, your job is not to execute on someone else's vision, not to, you know, make an app that, you know, has month over month user growth, like user growth is a sign that people are getting value out of it. Um, so your job is to deliver a product that people find value in using and that works for your overall business in terms of like the business model and the revenue model. <clears throat> and so this is hopefully a common, like I don't need to convince you of this, this is kind of like a reminder, common reminder, this is what our job is. But my assertion is that you are going to be more likely um, to achieve those two things. You're gonna be more likely to be able to build a product that people find value in if you can accelerate your rate of actionable learnings. So the only way that you can beat, you know, the startup that's trying to do what you're doing um, as well, or the only way you can make sure your company, you know, still continues to exist is if you learn faster than everyone else. And those learnings are actually in an area that you can then use to make your product better. And my second assertion is that's not an easy job to do, but you can make it easier on yourself by building up your credibility as a product leader within your organization. Um, so everything that I'm, the three examples that I'm gonna go into, um, it's kind of, they have these two, two pronged approaches where it's like, there are examples of how you can get better at the actual data analysis, but within the process, it's also, as you get better at the data analysis itself, it will demonstrate to your organization that you are good, um, a good product manager. You make good decisions because this is how you use data in your process. So we're working at both things, actually getting better at our job and also actually making it easier for us, you know, as a PM to do our jobs within our organizations. Cause it's not just about, can we make the right decisions, but it's like, then do we actually, you know, 
how can we make it happen within the organization? <clears throat> um, cool. So I am kind of obsessed with <laughs> these like little hacky ways that I figured out how to um, embed data in a lot of the things I do every day um, for a few couple of reasons. So first of all, I just feel like even though we all know that we should be thinking in terms of impact over shipping, it's really hard day to day to sometimes like remember that. Um, we have, you know, our executives asking us when things are going to be shipped and asking why things are late. And it can be really easy to just do quick responses and get sucked into the cycle of caring about checking the box rather than the impact. And so all of these tips is a reminder just to yourself to always be thinking about impact over, um, over sh checking the box. Um, and also, um, it will naturally deepen your understanding of the people who use your product. Um, the goal here is, you know, you want to understand the people using your product so well that you don't need to go do a five hour analysis of something to figure out if you should go with option A or option B. You automatically know because you so deeply understand them because you're talking to them so much and you're always looking at how they're using your product that you have, you, that it just has become second nature to you. Um, and uh, the less, and all of those things tie together to improve the speed and quality of your decisions because we have to make 100 decisions a day and we don't have time to do an analysis for each of them. We need to make them quickly. And so this is how you make them quickly while still making sure they're good. Um, and I think another piece of all of this is you might, I think this is where I get a lot of pushback on some of these ideas is because all of these examples are not only things that I do like just by myself in a corner as a product manager, like I do them publicly <laughs> and I'm going to challenge you all of these things. It's not just about you doing them. You need to do the, things that I'm about to show you regularly and you not just like every once a month, once a quarter, you need to do them every day and you need to do them in public. And that's because it's not just um, your job for you to think about impact over shipping. It's your job to make sure your team is thinking about impact over shipping, your entire, your engineering team, your design team, your stakeholders, however you think about your team, it, your job's going to be easier if they're thinking the way you're thinking as well. Um, and so it's not just about training your own mind, but it's about training their mind too. Um, and uh, it's also um, important because uh, I, I think just the general transparency and all of these ideas, it's about showing versus telling. So you're not you know, saying I'm the product manager and this is why we're gonna do these things. Um, you're letting them see your decision-making process, how you use data to come to a decision, and that is why they will go with your decision, um, not because you're telling them that they should. All right, I kind of want to just get into the examples. Um, okay, the this is the last thing I'll say before we get into the examples, which is um, everyone here, uh, also told me what is the hardest thing about um, do using data more in their day to day, uh, and <clears throat> I I don't want to say they're all excuses. They're all really good reasons, <laughs> but um, I think we it's really easy um, to kind of bucket these common complaints that we hear about why it's hard to do the job. Um, you know, we don't have good analytics tools, or they're not as fast as we want, or you know, we still need to figure out what metrics are important to us, or you know, we leadership um, isn't interested. As soon as we ship something, they just want to know when the next thing's going out. And there's a, all of these things are super valid. But my um, my challenge to you is, it's really just because we're taking the lazy approach, and it's easier to kind of just check the box, say it's shipped, move on and do the next thing, than it is to put yourself out there. Um, it's easier um, to kind of just give people what they want rather than actually trying to lead by example and um, lead with your hypotheses that could be right or could be wrong. Um, so, <clears throat> How do you actually um, do this general things that I'm talking about? Um, so I have three examples of um, ways that I have 
actually embedded data, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, from the users of our product back into um, how I write tickets, how I analyze feature usage, um, and how I share updates with stakeholders and the rest of the team. So those are the three examples I'm going to go through. Um, all of them, you'll see the similarities are, if not perfect, um, you just have to start somewhere. Um, you'll see the goal is to focus on daily small learnings rather than big ad hoc analyses um, and just consistency and patience and doing it over and over again. So these three teams uh, or these three themes are like what is key and like this is the method, this is the mindset that you should think in um, rather than the specific methods that I'm talking about. Um, so the first example I'm going to show is how I write um, tickets uh, with the actual like insight that I want to learn in mind. And I know this is kind of boring and I didn't want to start here because ticket template sounds so boring, but it really makes such a big difference like in day to day as a product manager. Um, and so what I do, and I'll, I'll re-review these tips at the end so you don't need to remember them now. Um, but so we, we happen to use Clubhouse um, I don't as the tool within our product dev team. So every, all the work that the engineers are doing, um, we manage through Clubhouse. I'm sure some people use it. You know, I've used Jira, I've used uh, Pivotal, every ticket tracking tool there is out there. Um, so it's not about the tool. I don't care what tool you use. Um, and I'm not going to get into the semantics of exactly, you know, how you break down your stories, how you write all these things. All I'm going to say is that um, I, uh, every tool I'm using, I create a super quick template. Um, and at, in the beginning, my template always had, it always has some type of, um, why are we doing this? What's like, what's the actual change that you want to make? Why are we doing that change? And then the details for, you know, the engineer to, need to know how to do it. So um, what are the requirements, details, whatever you want to call them, what are the designs, what are the assets, like all that good stuff. Um, so I, I've been doing that for a while, but what I've gotten, you know, more <clears throat> adamant about over the last few years is these two sections. So tracking and impact. Um, so every single piece of work that um, my product team works on, nothing, nothing goes out if it doesn't have associated tracking on it. And so when I say tracking, I mean, um, you know, let's say your product is a mobile app that, let's say your product is Airbnb, okay, the Airbnb app, um, and you want to add the ability for someone to um, favorite a house that they might want to stay at. Um, that feature does not go out if you don't have the associated tracking on it so you can know how that feature is being used. Um, so I don't care if it takes two days longer to go out. Why do I care if people can have this feature? If I have no idea if people are using it, I have no idea how they're using it, why they're using it. Like it's irrelevant to me if it gets out sooner, if it has no way for me to measure how it's actually being used. Um, and I, no matter what team like every team i've been on we've always kind of agreed on this track everything um and it doesn't matter because sometimes you always forget and some feature always goes out and you know you're putting together your product slides the next week for an update and you realize there's no tracking on this feature and it's been out for a few days and you don't know how it's being used and now you need to wait for a whole nother week for the tracking to get added and so by default all of my templates always have what tracking um, changes are required for this ticket. Um, and I always include, what do I wanna be tracked along with um, thinking through, basically ask yourself the question like, what, what are all the questions I might ask myself after? Um, just to make sure that I have all the data. Um, it, before it used to be more costly to track data and kind of more a pain in the, pain in the butt. So um, people used to be like, it, you know, you, you don't want your data to be too noisy. Only track it if you're definitely going to use it. I now I kind of am on of the mindset of like it's super cheap to track data, so just track everything. Um, so I just I thinking about the Airbnb example, you go through in your mind of okay, we're adding the ability to favorite um, 
a house, I might want to know, you know, uh, do people favorite it from the screen where they, the search results screen where they can see a bunch, um, or do they click into the detail page? Like, are they favoriting it from the full page? Um, are, um, what houses are people favoriting it on the most? Uh, are they houses that are more expensive? And because it's a bigger purchase and so they are saving it for later. You know, all the things that you might ask yourself in a couple of weeks, think about that now um, and make sure you're tracking the properties that you need to be able to do that. Um, and this is not like revolutionary. I would say a lot of people do this already, but the impact section um, is taking it to the next level. So it's not just saying, okay, I want to track these things. It's saying, okay, I want to track. So in this example, for example, this is, um looking at tags on a product so for example airbnb you're looking at a house it's tagged with like party house um ha has a outdoor space something um and so let's say this ticket is changing the way those tags looked so they look more fun and inviting so i want to be able to track when do people tap on those tags and then i'm asking myself why do i care um, and so when I, and what am I going to look at? So the impact, once I release it, I'm thinking leading and lagging, you can call them whatever you want, but really the first line is like, how is that feature being used? So it's immediate, it's immediate impact. It's like, how are people tapping on the tags? How frequently, um, what types of tags are they tapping on? Like feature level work. Lagging is more like, what is the impact that that feature change is having on things downstream now. So that's actually when you're starting to think more impact. So it's like, well, why did we work on this feature in the first place? Well, we worked on it because um, we think that if you can save it, you're more likely to return to it later, which would drive purchases up. So every feature like I release, I have, you know, what are the few metrics I'm probably gonna look, like, look at at the feature level? And then what are the metrics that are downstream? So how many times are people tapping on this new product tag that we just released? And also, um, have, uh, have we seen a change in overall people adding those products to their favorite list, booking those products, overall conversion rate, overall revenue, whatever those things that are important to your business might be. Um, and then, you know, this is an example of where it's like, just take it a step further and, you know, save yourself the headache next week when you're trying to do the analysis, like just make the links for that analysis handy right now. So it's like, okay, I've already done the thought now of, I want to know, I want to track every time a product tag is tapped. I want to know if changing the design of how we style these tags will increase people tapping on the tags which would then potentially increase them, adding them to favorites and ultimately booking. Um, I already um, likely have a lot, like all those downstream things in whatever tracking tool you use. I haven't used Mixpanel. Um, it, it, it's similar to Amplitude, any other product, whatever tracking tool you use, um, you probably have most of these metrics already in there. So rather than waiting, just, I'd link them directly to my ticket. So for example, this first, this first link um, might be a quick link to a dashboard of um, every time someone taps on a product page, I'm breaking it down by where in my product did they tap on it? You know, was it in the pro from the product page or was it from the explore page? Like this, you can either um, like create a placeholder report where it's like, you don't know the exact data yet, so you'll have to go back in and make some adjustments once it's live to make it work. Um, or it's like you already are telling exactly what the tracking naming is going to be. So you can just create the report kind of expecting certain naming conventions and um, link directly to um, that feature analysis. So for example, the reason this is so helpful is because now I'm coming back in on Monday. Um, things were released last week. I'm there's a mil everyone slacking me. I have so much going on. I need to prepare tickets for the engineers for tomorrow. Um, but we released a bunch of things last week and like, I wanna learn like, how were they working? Well, I don't need to now think about it all. It's all set up for me. So I just open up what tickets were deployed last week, 
and I just go click on the links and I'm like, okay, cool. Well, here's the breakdown that it looks like, um, okay, it seems like most people are tapping from the Explore page instead of the product page. Maybe that's not a huge insight, but it's a little thing that you can just log in your mind um, and come back to next time. Um, you click on the second link, which you already created your calculation ahead of time. Um, this is, for example, um, thinking about, you know, percent of your users using the favoriting feature. Um, so, for example, if our hypothesis was changing tag, like changing the tag design makes the product page more appealing, which makes people more likely to favorite it, you know, we don't only want to know are people tapping on the tags, we want to know are people actually favoriting more. Um, so I've already created a report in Mixpanel um, that the calculation is percent of people who favorited over all of our users. And I've already set it to map over weekly basis. Maybe I don't want to look at percent. The orange line is um, instead of looking how, how many people are using the feature, maybe you want to look at how frequently are they using the feature. So of everyone who, who favorited it, um, how many times are they favoriting? How many houses are they favoriting at once? Whatever it might be. But the point is these calculations are already set up. Um, so it's really quick for me to just come in, click on, this was released last week. I don't even need to expend any mental energy on how I'm supposed to measure it because I've already decided the point of this was to try to increase in favoriting. I now can see, oh, it actually kind of, yeah, it does kind of look like your favoriting has gone up over the last few weeks. Like that's kind of cool. Um, and then you can take it a step further if you want to, which is like, well, ultimately the whole goal of all of this is to drive, you know, people buying, reserving houses more, which, you know, just more bookings, higher conversion rate, more revenue. And so, you know, you can link to that dashboard too. This is an example of like, maybe you have overall percent of people who purchase, overall percent of people who add to cart or almost purchase, whatever those metrics are that you matter, that matter most to you. The whole point is um, think about it ahead of time and it will save yourself the trouble after the fact um, because the reality is we all say we're gonna get around to doing stuff, but we don't. It's very easy to get caught up in the day to day and to not to. Um, and you know, this is an example of like, you're not always gonna get the most actionable insights. Like in, in you might click on a, a chart and you're like, meh, it's kind of hard to tell. Like, I actually do need time to go deeper into this to know, like, is this having an impact on the numbers or maybe it, the numbers are changing because of something else or maybe I need to, you know, get a little more statistically significant and actually run this as an A-B test. Like, there are going to be times where you're like, this isn't enough for me to have a clear decision on, um, but that's okay. You can add that to your list, but at least you are starting to collect some information. Um, so I'm gonna summarize this example and then take a quick break because it's kind of hard for me to read the room and know if any of this is landing or not. But really the takeaways from the ticket template is um, it's one thing to in your mind say like, oh, I, I know I've thought about why we're doing this. And it's another thing to put pen to paper and say, this is why we're releasing the feature. This is how we're gonna assess impact. This is the specific metric I'm looking at, not generals, like specifically, this is the metric. And then setting yourself up for success for you know, your future self to thank your past self and making that those reports super already set up and easily accessible um, rather than keeping it on your to-do list and have it forever, you know, getting shifted to the next week. Um, and the other thing that I really like about this is just, it's all accessible to the team. So I don't need every engineer to look at, you know, the, the mixed panel report before they look on a feature, but if they want to, it's there. And there, then they know that I'm thinking about this and they know that that's part of my decision-making process. And that's how you naturally build trust with your team, because, you know, the next time you're disagreeing on something, they they know they're like well she probably yeah, has this opinion because she, it's not just an arbitrary thought she has you know she's looked at the data and then you can talk about that and it, it's a way to show them um how you make decisions rather than just expecting people to think because you have the title you get to make the calls <clears throat> 
Um, I think I've seen a few chats come through. Um, any questions, comments? Okay, one question has come in. How do you set criteria before you launch a feature on what numbers you need to hit to consider it successful? I feel like it's always a guess. Yeah, um, this is a really, really good question. So um, yeah, the question is kind of around targets. Um, and because I've talked a little more in generals, which is like, we want to work on this because we think it will increase this number. But I didn't say like, you know, this is only considered a success if it increases this number by 10% or 20% or whatever that may be. Um, I, if I'm being honest, I don't use targets like that on a feature level. Um, I use them more on like a quarterly um, and like initiative level. So um, like, if I'm thinking about this year, um, you know, I'll say like right now we have, okay, so I'll talk about something I'm doing right now. Um, con the product I work on, you can buy things, you know, so we look at the conversion rate um, and, you know, let's say we have a conversion rate of X percent currently, that's the baseline. Um, so what I usually start with is like, okay, is that good? Like, how do I know if that's good? And that's, so in general, I'll just start with doing like research online of like, what's a good conversion rate, trying to find whatever reading I can find, mixed panel, amplitude, products like that have started doing like regular reports um, where they aggregate data from all of their um, clients and we'll break it down by segment. So I try to find what's most applicable to me. So it's like, you know, if, I consider myself in the e-commerce market versus um, a B2B SaaS product or whatever it might be. Like, how can I get some benchmarks to know is my current conversion rate good, bad, how good or how bad? Because what you need to know is like, you might, like everyone always is like, versions, but what if you already have a great conversion rate and actually like, you know, all the hours you spend trying to improve it could only even improve, like, even if you do improve it, it's not going to have a major impact because you already have a great conversion rate, but maybe you actually have a really bad user acquisition funnel and that's where you should spend your time. So, um, yeah, so I would say <clears throat> I try to get some kind of benchmarks to understand how, how much room do we have potentially to improve this thing that we want to improve um, and then just work backwards from there, which is like, um, okay, our, our conversion rate can improve, break it down in the funnel. So, you know, um, is, is our right now compared to industry standard, do we have, are we lower, you know, from someone viewing a product to adding it to their cart or from them adding to their cart to checking out? And you start to like funnel it down from there. So what you're trying to figure out is where is your specific opportunity, biggest area of opportunity. Um, and um then so that's how you pick like which metric to focus on and then setting the actual target for it um because i'm working on earlier stage products it's kind of like we're, we always are just thinking big like i'm not interested in like a 0.1 percent optimization i'm like i want to like <laughs> 10x this so I, it's really just and like, I want to keep on working on it until we've gotten it to, you know, if our goal is to have, you know, products like ours are able to see a 10% conversion rate. If we're at 2%, I'm going to keep on working on it until we get it to 10% or until we've hit our head against the wall enough to say, you know what, we actually thought we could get a 10%. We've gotten it to eight. We've talked to people. We think now that we talked to our users, we understand why it's going to be a little lower than our competitors and we think eight is good. So it's kind of like an evolving process of um, targets are helpful, um, but I think it's more like just using it as a gauge for you to make sure that you're going after the biggest area of opportunity rather than saying like, we did it or we didn't do it. Um, I'm going to go on to the next example. The next two are shorter, um, so I will finish them in time, although I 
um, might not have time for as many questions as I thought. Um, this example is specifically using Slack. Um, once again, do not focus on the tool itself um, or even like if you don't use Slack, if you use something else, even if you don't use chat at all, like this can be done via email. Like it's not about the tools, it's about the example as inspiration, it's about the general mindset. Um, and so this is something that I started doing honestly with like no idea of how it was really gonna be used. <laughs> I kind of just randomly was like, this might be fun. Um, and it was also, I started doing it thinking not, so the last example was very specifically kind of like for the dev team of like, how can we make sure, you know, everyone knows why we're working on things and how we're assessing the impact. This one is more about how can I involve the entire organization or, you know, this specific team or this specific set of stakeholders in the process? Because as a PM, your job's going to be easier um, if it's not just your engineering team who understands why you work the way you work, but it's everyone. Everyone's thinking in a hypothesis mindset and an impact driven mindset. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this is an example of how to engage with people outside of product and engineering. Uh, and so, um, what we what we started doing, and once again, don't get tied on the specifics, because if you're a big company, you obviously are not going to want to have a bot that streams in every time you have a purchase. But maybe it can, you know, every week summarize your purchases. Like you can do, take this idea and apply it in a lot of different ways. But what we do is, you know, we were all virtual at the beginning of this of last year. Um, you know, not as much excitement because you just don't have the energy of the office. You don't talk to people as naturally. So I was like, wouldn't it be fun if every time someone bought something in our app, like it just automatically posted to Slack um, as like a celebration. Like obviously the revenue team already knows when purchases are happening. It's not like they don't have this information, but honestly, maybe like our, my engineers probably don't know every time, like when purchases are happening and they might not even know like, um, <clears throat> what are being, what activities are being purchased the most um, or things like that, that maybe they should. Um, so I set up a bot, we use Shopify. Um, if people want to talk details about like how to hack things, <laughs> trying to not have to do any work, I am a pro at uh, figuring out how to do that. So I'm happy to brainstorm on that. But basically every time someone purchases something, this little Bridget bought says so and so bought something, um, and I and that's all it was for now. I wasn't even sure I was going to invite a bunch of people to this channel to start out with because I thought maybe everyone would find it annoying. Um, but the customer support team um, started kind of being like, "Oh, this is actually more handy than like the email we get. I'd rather get this alert in Slack. Like now, I don't need to be checking my Gmail all the time." They were like, "Is it easy to link out to the order in Shopify? Because that's how I how they fulfill it." I was like yeah, it's very easy. I can just put in the user ID or the order ID. So I added a link to Shopify and I added also a link to our internal tool um, just because why not? Um, people actually started clicking on those things and I realized it's always annoyed me that, you know, we have multiple different systems, you know, everyone's probably the same way. It's like our order information is in one system, our app information is in a different system, our email information is in a third. Yeah, that's annoying, but just because they're in different systems doesn't mean that um, I can't just quickly look at them all and still get an overall view of the user. I mean, I'd prefer them to be all together and just had to click one link, but like, why don't I just link to them all and see what happens? So I expanded it to that. Um, then one week I was like, okay, I know I can't do this forever, but I feel like now that like these are posting all the time, I'm just getting so many ideas from seeing these purchases come through. So I had a personal goal where every time a purchase came through, um, I clicked open all these links and I just quickly learned as much as I could. Literally, I put a minute cap on it and I threaded on the Slack message, whatever I learned. So it just stream of consciousness. You can see lots to learn from this user stream. Um, it looks like in the first session, they like looked at all sections of our app. Then they looked at this product. Then they created a, a, way, a, a poll for someone to vote if you wanna do this or that. Um, then they came back in and purchased. And 
So the reason this example I think is helpful is because a lot of times as PMs, like we kind of present this analysis where it's like, you know, last week we released a feature and 57% of the time it was used, you know, in this context and 2% of the time in that. And that's great because you do need aggregate data to make decisions. But really, like when you're talking, especially to people outside of the engineering organization, like people can't process that information. Like you need to, like, how are real people using your product? Like, it's not that 57% of the time, like I use it with my right hand and the other time with my, it's like, no, I'm Sarah, I'm sitting here. I'm brow looking at a page it's showing me this information. I, I need to get more information before I booked it. And, and thinking about it like that as the user flow, um, can really help you get better at understanding what metrics matter to your product. So yeah, basically I just, every time a bot came through or a purchase came through, I quickly tried to pull as much information as I can, didn't try to overthink it, didn't try to do a full analysis and just stream of consciousness shared whatever I learned right there. So then everyone in the company could see it if they want to, but if they don't, they don't have to look at it. Um, I also realized I started every time wondering, like, did they use a promo code? So I kind of just started quickly adding that um, on every Slack. Um, also, sometimes I use this as a chance to kind of like connect the dots and give visibility to people on the team. So, um, you know, a lot of times we'll give reports as a product manager where it's like, you know, here's the status update on this project and, you know, this is on track and this is, but it's like, the other day a purchase came through from a test we were running. It's like call it out right there so people can see the tangible impact of the things that you're testing out. Um, and that, and then the whole point of this example is it's a, like doing things manually and not knowing where you're gonna take it is the only way to get to something that's actually valuable. Because you know, I did that for a few days and I was like, okay, this is stupid. I can't like just ramble on every alert that comes through. So then I kind of started doing my own template where it's like, I, for every single purchase that came through, I looked up, you know, who was the person who made the purchase? What features did they use? And kind of started doing a checklist of like, oh, it looked like, you know, they viewed this page at least 10 times. It looks like they favorited it. It looks like they um, clicked on this button. It looks like they used a promo code. Sometimes I would even include an image of the person um, because if they, you know, took the time to set their profile image, like how can we start connecting the people building our product to our end users? Um, and I think the whole the whole point of this is not, um, you know, that you should manually do all of this stuff. I stopped doing it after, you know, a week or two um, because it's, it's not sustainable. But what it made me do was one, um, figure out how to improve the bot. So now it's way more skimmable. So, you know, the information that I started regularly writing about, I realized I can just pull from our analytics data and drop it straight in here. Um, and it also um, made me get smarter about what are leading indicator metrics that I do want to track. So for example, because I was manually looking through all these streams, you know, now our goals are different. They're not just, you know, how many people are purchasing it's you know i noticed every stream that i looked at last week started with people you know uploading an itinerary photo in their first um session or a profile photo sorry in their first session so you know maybe um getting people to set up their profile in the first day is actually a, a tactic to increasing um bookings down the line because now they're invested in the app and now that's our leading indicator metric. Um, and I think the last, like the most exciting thing that I like about this example is it's just like kind of fun and collaborative. So now I don't post on most of these anymore because I, it's just, I, I'm <laughs> just have run out of time, but I go back and check and other people are talking about it. So everyone in the company is like, oh, cool. That's the first purchase that just came through for that product. Like, I wonder why. And then three ideas that you know, how we can improve the product come out of that. And those things are now ideas on our, on our roadmap that we're working on. So it's really just a way to have data as a jumping off point. Um, and I think the, wow, it's already 3 p.m. Um, and the main takeaway for this one that I'll just kind of reiterate is thinking about, you know, 
depending on what audience you're trying to reach with um, these different tactics, you know, think about what tools they're already in. Um, don't try to get them to like start using a new dashboarding tool. Like if they're already in Slack every day, do it in Slack. If they're already in G uh, Outlook every day, do it there. Like don't try to don't try to change their daily habits to fit your needs. You need to do the opposite. Um, and you know, it's okay to have a little fun with it. It's okay to like, you know, do things that are more manual so you can figure out the best place to take things. Um, and I think all of that is really where I'll end today. Um, and I'll share the slide so you can look at the last example on your own, which is kind of like the my overarching methodology and like belief in product overall is like the only it's almost counterintuitive but like the only way you're gonna um you know work on things that matter pick the right metrics like focus on impact get credibility of your organization is actually by like messing up and getting it wrong and like doing it in public so all of these things the it's it's okay that they're imperfect and um kind of like you know informal um, because that's actually what will lead people to trust you more as a PM um, and to see how your thought process works and to realize like, you know, oh, you know, all, all she's doing is um, just trying to make the best decision with the information available. And it's kind of people like being, seeing the thought process and you bringing them along that journey rather than keeping it kind of like closed off in a black box of, of how all that's done. And all that is just staying humble and checking your ego at the door and being okay with being wrong, um, releasing a dashboard that isn't perfect yet, but you know, because you release it in a few months, it'll be way more valuable than if you never tried it at all. Um, so I, like I said, um, I have one more example, but it was the shortest and least exciting. So you can just click through the slides on your own when I share them. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, and all I really wanted to end on is just kind of like the reminder overall of, um, you know, all of this is to make sure we're focusing on the actual impact we're trying to drive and building something that's valuable for people um accelerating our learning in order to make better decisions um building credibility throughout the organization uh and uh just using kind of these tactics that i was talking about around embedding data analysis in the tools you're already using focusing on doing things daily rather than trying to do you know big analyses that you continuously put off uh, and um, just you know, putting yourself and your and your thought process out there um, will I think help you be a better PM day to day. I recognize that some people might have to jump to things already but i'm happy to stay on a little longer to answer any questions or um anything anyone has people can come off mute or i can read some in the chat whatever is best i'm going to stop sharing actually so i can see people's faces because it's kind of hard when i can't okay I'm going to read a couple questions in the chat. Um, people feel free to stay or not stay. Thank you for coming. Hopefully it's helpful if you do have to leave. Um, let's see. James, are you still here? Do you have to go? Okay. You had to leave. Will is here. Maybe I'll ask Will's question. Bye everyone. Oh, hey, Will. Well, I can't hear you. You're muted. <laughs> Will, I still can't hear you. Also there. Not I never use Zoom. <laughs> so anyways, I had that question, but the but then I saw the Slack thing, and I'm just like seething in jealousy for how good of an idea that was, and how <laughs> like you know simple and. 
you know, it makes me like mad that I haven't been doing that for years. So I thought that was awesome. I totally agree. Like I, I do that to myself every day where I'm like, what? wait, why didn't I think about this sooner? What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So there's not a ton of questions in the chat from people who are, who aren't, who are still here. So I guess anyone who's still here, it's okay if you don't have any, but if you do have questions or want to dig into any of those topics, I do have some time left. Um, or if you just want to introduce yourself. Now I'm ready for the next one, Sarah. This is awesome. I'm glad you, you took the time. I would sit here and listen for, you know, all afternoon. Thank you. I mean, I need to, um, I need to figure out timing, to be honest. Um, Claire, you can stop recording if you want.